We are in for a terrific treat tonight, and thank you all for attending. My name is Jonathan Woods, and I'm the President General of the Society of the Cincinnati. A little bit of housekeeping before we get on with the, with the program. Following this, this wonderful bit of entertainment we're about to have, we're going to all come out through this door, head upstairs for a wonderful cocktail hour or so, while, while our team downstairs takes away all these chairs, brings in new chairs, brings in new tables, and sets us up for a wonderful buffet dinner. But so if, if we could quietly and, and, and reasonably, when it's time, leave this room, head upstairs, it would be greatly appreciated by all. I think that's all I have to do for housekeeping. Excellent, okay. Uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce to all of you Dr. Cordell Bragg, who is our history chairman, and, a, and as well as being a wonderful person from, from the, the deep part of Georgia, and, we are, and of which we have a number of representatives, Bill, um, Dr. Chip Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President General. As the stewards of American history, it is our duty as set forth in the institution of the Society of the Cincinnati to perpetuate the remembrance of this vast event. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, to that end, on behalf of the officers and membership of our One Society of Friends, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the 39th George Rogers Clark Lecture. This lecture series, begun in 1975, has featured the country's top historians. We have always prided ourselves on bringing you the best of the very best, and tonight is no exception. Dr. Robert J. Allison is a self-described former college dropout <laughs> and, and traveling chef whose interest in American history was kindled by the books he read. Once he decided to finish school, he hitched a ride with a friend to Boston because, in his words, he knew there were schools there. <laughs> and there were. He was right. Bob received his Ph.D. from Harvard in 1992, and he is currently chairman of the history department at Suffolk University in Boston. He also teaches at the Harvard Extension School, where he finished his undergraduate degree, and he has received accolades from both institutions for his teaching excellence. Bob resides in South Boston, just down the street from Dorchester Heights, with his lovely wife, Phyllis, who he married in 1985. And they have two sons, John and Phil. Instead of reciting a long list of his published works and historical extracurricular activities, of which there are many, let me share with you what his students have said. Amazing what you can find out online these days. <laughs> Professor Allison would rather have you learn than torment you with assignments and tests. He has an extreme passion for history and gives all the cool details that you would never hear elsewhere. He knows everything you could want to know about history and, and Boston but he does not act like he is better than his students at all. And my favorite, I thought this was going to be the worst class ever, <laughs> but it was actually interesting and fun. I'm pleased to say that one thing that differentiates Dr. Allison from most of our Clark lecturers is that in addition to his many academic achievements, he is also one of us, an honorary member of the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati. In addition to tonight's program, Bob and Phyllis will be spending the weekend here with us and attending tomorrow night's banquet, and I'm sure we'll all enjoy getting to know them better. Therefore, without further delay, please join me in welcoming to the podium our 2017 George Rogers Clark Lecturer, Dr. Robert J. Allison. Well, thank you very much, Chip, for that wonderful introduction. I'm always nervous when I say, let's hear what his students have to say. <laughs> and, and I never thought I would receive a greater honor 
than I did when I was inducted as an honorary member into the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati. And I don't think I did until I received a letter last fall from Chip inviting me to come and deliver the George Rogers Clark Lecture here at Anderson House. So this is really a wonderful institution and a great honor which I treasure. Now, looking ahead from the middle of the 18th century, that's after a half a century during which the population of British North America doubled, Benjamin Franklin speculated that by 1850, the greatest number of Englishmen will be on this side of the Atlantic. What, and he said, what an accession of power to the British Empire by sea as well as by land. What an increase of trade and navigation. What numbers of ships and seamen. Now he didn't anticipate that there would be any change in the political connection between these parts of the empire, but expected them fully to remain bound together. But what changed in the 1760s was that the British Parliament took a greater hand in trying to govern the various parts of the empire, and this upset the established practices in each of these very different colonies in North America. Colonies which had governed themselves now, in some cases for almost two centuries, with very little interference from across the ocean. Now, the colonies of North America are very different places. From the British point of view, the most important Western Hemisphere colonies were Barbados and Jamaica, which produced real wealth for the empire, the sugar islands of the West Indies. That would be the focus of British interest in the Americas. Now, if we move north and just look at these different places, and I know members come from these different places, so I hope I'm not giving too much away or misrepresenting these various interesting parts of North America. The newest of the British North American colonies, of course, was Georgia. I know there are Georgians here. Um, and Georgia had been established both to be a buffer between South Carolina and Spanish Florida and to give British merchants a competitive entree into trade with the Creeks and the Cherokee rivaling the Spanish merchants who were in places like Pensacola and New Orleans, and also as a new world refuge where the poor of England and the indebted could regenerate themselves in the new world. However, England's destitute arriving in Georgia wondered why they could not regenerate themselves better by enslaving others as their neighbors in South Carolina did. And the philanthropic sponsors of Georgia resisted this until relenting, and by the Middle decades of the century, about half of Georgia's population of about 50, 30,000 people were enslaved on the rice plantations. Now, it wasn't philanthropists, but Barbadian Jama and Jamaican sugar planters who established South Carolina toward the end of the 17th century. And South Carolina was unique at the time of the revolution in that six out of every 10 people was actually enslaved on the rice plantations along the coast. That's more people than lived in Rhode Island or Delaware or New Hampshire. And Charlestown in South Carolina, then called Charlestown, was actually the only urban center south of Philadelphia. And many of the gentry would retire to Charlestown during the miserable, sickly summer months or else they would retreat to Newport in Rhode Island or even to England. And the planters of South Carolina were wary both of this large in, uh, labor for, enslaved labor force, but also of the Scots-Irish and German immigrants who were rapidly filling the back country of South Carolina, moving into these societies, creating these societies. They were very different from the coastal world of the uh, rice plantations. Scots-Irish, Scottish Highlanders, Germans were also flooding into North Carolina, into the interior, the Piedmont country, quadrupling North Carolina's population in the years between 1750 and the time of the revolution, when North Carolina was both the fastest growing and the fourth largest North American colony, with 200,000 people. And in fact, in the decade of the revolution, another 90,000, that's more than lived in New Hampshire, would arrive in the back country settling on the borders between the Cherokee, Catawba, and Lumbee, and ignoring the pretended cultural superiority of the tobacco gentry on the coast. 
Tobacco dominated both Virginia and Maryland, which were among the earliest of Britain's colonies. And by the time of the revolution, by the late 18th century, they were mature plantation societies. And Virginia was by far the largest British North American colony in both land and population. It was home now to half a million people, 200,000 of them enslaved. And the world's tobacco market by this point was glutted and the tidewater soil was so depleted that the planters of Virginia were looking west beyond the mountains to new, for new land to plant and to sell. And the ambitious Virginians built a fort where the Monongahela and the Allegheny Rivers formed the Ohio River. And this was actually land that lay within the charter claims of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, of course, the thriving colony along the Delaware that had been founded by Quakers who were determined to be fair to the native people and Pennsylvania's merchants at this point are defying New York's claim to a monopoly on the Indian trade, and they're negotiating their own deals with the Tuscarora and the Delaware, and they're also defying Virginia's claims to the West. Pennsylvania was less religiously rigid than the New England colonies, which I'll be discussing in a moment, and it had better soil and a better climate than New England did and this drew in more immigrants. By 1750, that is the year Franklin is speculating on the population of British North America over the next 100 years, Philadelphia was the second busiest port in the British Empire, as well as one of the largest cities in the British Empire. And it was sending out corn and grain to feed the laborers in Barbados and Jamaica, also bringing in English, German, Scots-Irish, Scottish immigrants to farm their own fertile land in the Delaware and Susquehanna River Valleys. The Dutch had established the New Netherlands back in the early 17th century as a trading base for trade with the Iroquois, the most powerful Native American group in North America. But then the British seized it in about 1660, renamed it New York, but they retained the Dutch trade model. The lower, the lower uh, Hudson River Valley, the area around Manhattan, was a provisioning ground to supply the trading post at Albany. In 1776, Henry Knox speculated that Albany would have to become the capital of North America because it was such an important place. New York had a certain idea of its own hegemony, which crosses over into northern New Jersey and along both shores of Long Island Sound and as far north as Lake Champlain, although New York's neighbors didn't always recognize her imperial dreams. Now, New England had been founded by religious dissenters, and these colonies were culturally homogeneous. Then they prospered through trade, turning the forests in, of New England into ships and barrels to carry the empire's goods from the West Indies to New England and beyond. Codfish caught in the cold coastal waters would be dried and salted on the rocky shores and they would feed the enslaved people of the West Indies. The very term Yankee came from a Dutch term meaning a hard bargainer. These New Englanders who had more power to govern themselves than any other people in the British Empire held fast to the faith of their fathers the popular hymn of 1770, let tyrants shake their iron rod and slavery clank her galling chains. We fear them not, we trust in God. New England's God forever reigns, rang out in the churches of New England, but probably did not have as much resonance further south where New England's God <laughs> wouldn't be as feared or celebrated. Now, before uh, the rebellion begins in New England, and that's a, really a story for another day about how it begins, but before Bostonians set out in December of 1773 to destroy the East India Company's tea, Josiah Quincy warned at the Old South Meeting House in one of these tumultuous meetings preceding that celebrated event that whoever supposes that shouts and hosannas will terminate the trials of the day entertains a childish fancy. He knew that they were bringing on a violent conflict 
and that their popular resolves, popular harangues, popular acclamations, and the popular vapors circulating throughout the room would not defeat their foes. Instead of making speeches and passing resolutions, he said, they should look to the end. Let us weigh and consider before we advance to those measures which must bring on the most terrifying and terrific struggle this country ever saw. Quincy anticipated this, and once the British government responded to the T's destruction by shutting down Boston, Quincy left for England to try to avert this crisis. His colleague John Adams set out for Philadelphia for the first meeting of the Continental Congress. Now, Quincy had already traveled through North America. In fact, he has a wonderful travel journal of his time in Charleston. And of course, he also visits London, as I said. He knew North America in a way John Adams didn't. John Adams' trip to Philadelphia in the fall of 1774 was his first trip outside New England, and really his first opportunity to meet people who were not New Englanders. And this Congress is the first opportunity for Americans who came from different parts of this empire to meet one another. And John Adams was not impressed. He said that New York's streets were vastly more regular and elegant than those in Boston, and the houses were more grand as well as neat. Almost all were of brick, and all were painted. But, he said, with all the opulence and splendor of this city, there is very little good breeding to be found. <laughs> I have not seen one real gentleman, one well-bred man since I came to town. There is no conversation that is agreeable. There is no modesty, no attention to one another. They talk very loud, very fast, and all together. And if you ask a question, before you can utter three words of your answer, they break in upon you again, and they talk away. He also visited Princeton, and he found that the chorus of Princetonians, who had been assembled by the Reverend Witherspoon to entertain them, sing as badly as the Presbyterians of New York. <laughs> Philadelphia's regularity and elegance were strikingly different from Boston. But Philadelphia, with all its trade, wealth, and regularity, is not Boston. The morals of our people are much better. <laughs> Manners more polite and agreeable. They are purer English. Our language is better. Our persons are handsomer, our spirit is greater, our laws are wiser, our religion is superior, our education is better. We begin to see why, in many ways, these still are the hallmarks of the New England identity, that we are better than everyone else. <laughs> and it may also suggest why the rest of the country doesn't always agree with our assessment of this. And so he concludes by saying, we exceed them in everything, but in a market and in charitable public foundations. Now, those are not small things. Now, New England's religion might be, according to Adams, superior, but Philadelphia actually had more variety, an astonishing variety of religious, religious practices in Philadelphia. And while he was in town, Adams visited Presbyterian, Methodist, Moravian, Anglican, Quaker, Baptist, and even a Catholic church, usually attending at least two every Sunday. The Presbyterians, he said, were neither numerous nor polite. The Anglicans, though, with their organ and choir, were very musical, unlike the Princetonians. But their minister, celebrated here as a fine speaker, Adams thought was confused and indifferent. The Moravian church, he heard soft, sweet music and a Dutchified English prayer and preachment, but except for one Anglican minister, the Reverend Jacob Duche, who was a fine preacher indeed, Adam said he heard no preachers here like ours in Boston. We have better sermons, better prayers, better speakers, softer, sweeter music, and genteeler company. At the Baptist church, he heard a, pre he heard a preacher from the back parts of Virginia beyond the Allegheny Mountains. He preached an hour and a half, no learning, no grace of action or utterance, but an honest zeal. He told us several good stories. Now that same evening at a different church, he heard an old soldier named Webb, who had been a quartermaster in the Seven Years' War, who was one of the most fluent, eloquent men I ever heard. 
He reaches the imagination and touches the passions very well and expresses himself with great propriety. The singing here is very soft and sweet indeed. And Adams, the New England Puritan, even visited the mother church, or as he called it in a letter to Abigail, the grandmother church. St. Mary's, one of the few Catholic churches in the entire empire, and at this Romish chapel, as he called it, he heard a good discourse upon the duty of parents to their children, founded in justice and charity. And he was nearly enchanted, he said, by the paintings, the bells, the candles, the gold and silver, our savior on the cross over the altar at full length, all his wounds of bleeding. The chanting is exquisitely soft and sweet. And he said here where there is everything which can lay hold of the eye, the ear, and the imagination, everything which can charm and bewitch the simple and ignorant, I wonder how Luther ever broke the spell. <laughs> this very religious diversity that existed across these colonies really did seem to be a factor against unity. In fact, at the first session of the Congress, Thomas Cushing of Massachusetts proposed that the Congress open its session with a prayer. Now, almost immediately, John Jay of New York and John Rutledge of South Carolina, fearing that this was a Congregationalist power play, objected, saying, we are so divided in religious sentiments, some Episcopalians, some Quakers, some Anabaptists, some Presbyterians, and even some Congregationalists, we could not join in the same act of worship. Samuel Adams, New England Congregationalist, and also a savvy politician, disagreed. He said he was no bigot. He could hear a prayer from a gentleman of piety and virtue who was at the same time a friend to his country. And though Adams said, I am a stranger here in Philadelphia, he had heard that a Mr. Duché deserved that character. And so Adams, the Congregationalist, and as he said, not a bigot, and as he did not need to say, a very shrewd politician, suggested that Duché be invited to come the next morning to read prayers. And this was a brilliant political stroke on Adams's part, inviting a Philadelphia Anglican, a churchman who had been ordained in London by a bishop and whose liturgy still included prayers for His Majesty King George III to come and open the session of Congress. And the next morning, September the 7th of 1774, along with rumors that British ships had bombarded the town of Boston, the Reverend Duché appeared in full pontificalibus, as Adams put it, his Anglican robes and regalia, accompanied by a clerk. And remember, one of the nascent grievances of the Americans, particularly the Congregationalists, was that the British crown wanted to institute bishops here. And here you have an Anglican clergyman coming to open this session of Congress, and he concluded his prayers for the day with the collect, which happened to be Psalm 35. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. John Adams said he never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read that morning. And then unexpectedly and, and extemporaneously, Duché began to pray. Now Adams said he had never heard a better prayer or one given with such fervor, such ardor, such earnestness and pathos, and in language so elegant and sublime. For America, for the Congress, for the province of Massachusetts Bay, and especially the town of Boston, it has had an excellent effect upon everybody here. Now, this ecumenical moment didn't last because an uninvited guest had followed Adams the Adamses and the other New Englanders to Philadelphia, also like them seeking relief from oppression. But the Reverend Isaac Bacchus was not struggling with Parliament. He was actually struggling with the Massachusetts Assembly, the same body which sent the Adamses, Hancock, Cushing, et al. to Philadelphia, taxed Isaac Bacchus and his Baptist flock in Middleborough, Massachusetts to support the Congregational Church in Middleborough, Massachusetts. And Bacchus asked Congress, was not this taxation without representation? 
and he asked if the Congregationalists of Massachusetts should pay taxes to support King's Chapel, the Anglican Church in Boston. Robert Treat Payne, one of the Boston delegates, answered, the Baptists really aren't arguing about a matter of principle, he said. They really just don't want to pay taxes. And Bacchus said, that's exactly what Parliament says about you and your arguments about taxation. Now, Congress, which was less vested in supporting the Congregational Church in Massachusetts than were the delegates from Massachusetts, thought that Bacchus had a point. And not only did they invite Bacchus to open a session of Congress with prayer, as the Adamses, by inviting Duché, had opened that particular door, they also advised the delegates from Massachusetts to relieve the Baptists of this tax burden the delegates from Massachusetts promised that they would look into it when they got back. Only John Adams from Massachusetts, this delegation, took this seriously, and only he would still be alive when the Massachusetts Constitution did actually relieve the Baptists in 1820. Now, it should cause us to wonder, as we look at this revolutionary generation, not that why they have failed to achieve perfection, but that in an era when religious identity was fundamental, and in these colonies, some of them born of the religious tumult of the Reformation, that these men were able to bridge divides among people of different faiths and ultimately build the one, one of the truly revolutionary things they achieved, that is, the idea of religious freedom. Not just the freedom to worship, but the very freedom to believe. And this is one of the remarkable achievements of this generation although it was not inevitable. And it's even more unlikely that in declaring and achieving independence, these Americans from very different societies, all of them either dependent on enslaved labor or enjoying its benefits, will stake their argument on the fundamental premise of human liberty. One wonders why they would raise this issue in the first place. It opened the way for Dr. Samuel Johnson in 1773 to denounce them as moral hypocrites. How is it, he wrote, that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from the drivers of Negroes? Now in that same year, four men who were enslaved in Massachusetts, Peter Bestas, Sambo Freeman, Felix Holbrook, and Chester Joy, petitioned the Massachusetts Assembly for release from bondage. We expect great things from men who have made such a noble stand against the designs of their fellow men to enslave them. Wonderful rhetorical statement here. Now, scoring a rhetorical point on American hypocrisy was enough for Dr. Johnson, but it would not be enough for Bestus, Freeman, Holbrook, and Joy, or for Isaac Backus, who genuinely expected these men to live up to the standard they had set. So we should not be astonished that men who profess a belief in liberty should own others, but the men who owned others would stake their lives on liberty as a common birthright for all people. And they used the language of liberty knowingly. Less than a decade after Johnson's jive and Pestis and Freeman's petition, a jury in Worcester, Massachusetts interpreted the first article of the state's constitution, that is that all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and inalienable rights to mean exactly what it said and forbid one man, in this case Nathaniel Jennison, from owning another, Quack Walker. Now neither of these outcomes, religious liberty or the end of slavery, would be inev was inevitable, but neither was independence itself. In fact, when John Adams reached Congress, that outcome seemed least likely of all from this meeting. The members, Adams said, were like ambassadors from a dozen belligerent powers of Europe nay, of a conclave of cardinals at the election of a pope, or the princes of Germany at the choice of an emperor. Yet, he said, they all profess the same principles. Fifty gentlemen meeting together, all strangers, not acquainted with each other's language, ideas, views, designs. They're jealous of each other, fearful, timid, skittish. And now some of the men with whom he had corresponded, or whose essays or pamphlets he had read, puzzled him or disappointed him. Philadelphia lawyer John Dickinson, whose Farmer's Letters of 1767 really expressed the American cause forcefully and effectively, 
Adam said was subject to hectic complaints. He is a shadow, tall, slender as a reed, pale as ashes. One could think at first sight he could not live a month. But Dickinson, he said, has an excellent heart. The cause of his country lies near it. Caesar Rodney of Delaware, and by the way, if I'm mentioning an ancestor of someone, feel free to stand up with a rebuttal or a correction. <laughs> Caesar Rodney of Delaware was the oddest looking man in the world. He is tall, thin, slender as a reed, pale, his face not bigger than a large apple. Yet there is sense, fire, spirit, wit, and humor in his countenance. New Jersey's William Livingston is a plain man, tall, black wears his hair, nothing elegant or genteel about him. They say he is no public speaker, but very sensible and learned and a ready writer. John Rutledge's appearance is not very promising. There's no keenness in his eye, no depth in his countenance, nothing of the profound, sagacious, brilliant, or sparkling in his first appearance. Rutledge's younger brother, Ned, just 24 years old, told me he studied three years at the temple. He thinks this a great distinction. Says that young gentlemen ought to travel early to acquire freedom and ease of behavior. Ned, Ned Rutledge, Adam said, was young, sprightly, but not deep. He is the most indistinct, inarticulate way of speaking. Speaks through his nose. A wretched speaker in conversation. He seems good-natured, though conceited. Now, seeming to share Adams's opinions of some of the other delegates was Patrick Henry. And Henry told Adams that he had no public education. At 15, he read Virgil and Livy, has not looked into a Latin book since. His father left him at that age. He's been struggling through life ever, ever since. He has high notions, talks about exalted minds, etc. has a hard opinion of Galloway, Jay, the Rutledges, their system, he says, would ruin the cause of America. He is very impatient to see such fellows and not be at liberty to describe them in their true colors. Now, Adams at first was struck by the difference between these delegates, but then found their common commitment to principles engaging and inspiring. But after a month of the delegates' determined demonstration of their dedication to the cause, Adams found their discussions tiresome. Every man in Congress is a great orator, a critic, a statesman. Therefore, every man upon every question must show his oratory, his criticism, and political abilities. And what the Congress wound up doing was drafting a petition to the king, asking him to have Parliament back down. And they prepare, it takes two weeks then, once they have decided to write the petition, to prepare it, and the petition then is sent off as the delegates prepare to adjourn, and the delegates will return to Philadelphia the following May, by which time they will have received an answer from London. And before leaving, the Pennsylvania Assembly hosted Congress at an entertainment at the City Tavern, and Adams was struck by this elegant entertainment where a sentiment was given, a toast, may the sword of the parent never be stained with the blood of her children. Over against Adams at the table were two or three Quakers. One of them said, this is not a toast, but a prayer. Let's join in it. And they took their glasses accordingly. They were drinking to avoid a war that all knew would be calamitous. And as they were doing so, Josiah Quincy and Benjamin Franklin were in London trying to avert this war, hoping that the Parliamentary elections in the fall of 1774 would oust the North Ministry, and they did not. Franklin and Quincy and like-minded Brit Britons continued their efforts to avert what they knew would be a catastrophe. Catherine Howe challenged, through an intermediary, Benjamin Franklin to a series of chess matches at her home, and Franklin came to play chess against her and this actually was a pretext so that her brother, Admiral Sir Richard Howe, soon to be commander of British forces in North America, could meet with Benjamin Franklin, the unofficial emissary of the Americans. The Howes, Franklin, Quincy, all were hoping to avert this war and save what Franklin called the fragile China vase, the British Empire. But as we know, the war came. 
Sir Richard and his brother, General William Howe, would go to America, their mission to put down this rebellion and to win back the loyalty of the disaffected Americans. And only one of these, of course, is a military objective. The fact that Americans had so little in common with one another was very much a factor on the empire's side. In fact, Sir Henry Clinton, the general who would succeed Howe in command in 1778, had spent some years of his youth in New York, where his father was the royal governor, and he thought Britain's best strategy would be to withdraw all of her forces to Canada and to Florida, leaving the Americans in between to fight it out amongst themselves. And he thought that after they exhausted themselves in killing one another, they would beg His Majesty's government to return and restore peace and order. And of course, once General Washington took command of the Continental Army in 1775, and he met the New England soldiers who mainly peopled it, he was also skeptical that there could be a military solution to this. The Massachusetts Provincial Congress had told him that the Massachusetts soldiers were smart and naturally brave but Washington found their officers to be the most indifferent kind of people I ever saw, and the soldiers exceedingly dirty and nasty people. And he said they won't sense any danger till a bayonet is pushed into their breasts. Their bravery, Washington said, is only an, un un an unaccountable kind of stupidity in the lower class of people. It is beyond the power of conception to discover the absurdities and partiality of these people. He could see their quality, and actually he thought with better officers they might become better soldiers, to which of course we owe your ancestors uh, work, and no one could tell him even how many men were in his camp, a camp that stretched from Cambridge to Roxbury encircling the British in Boston. Even counting the regiments wouldn't help get a number. Each regiment from Connecticut had a thousand men. Rhode Island and New Hampshire regiments each had 590, and that was the same number as the Massachusetts regiments, except the Massachusetts regiments, which had 649 men. Washington knew a regular army could make an accurate count in an hour, but for this one, it took more than a week of delays and excuses <laughs> before he found out that the 20,000 men he had told were in camp ready to fight actually numbered about 14,000. Then reor reorganizing it to make it more effective would be nearly impossible. Each unit was a self-contained community coming from one of these New England towns. The soldiers chose their officers and they would not conceive themselves bound to serve with any other or obey any other. A captain must be with this regiment, a subaltern with that company. Men and even officers from one province would have nothing to do with those from another. Washington found that he had to give in to the humor and whimsy of the people or get no army. And in fact, every day brought more evidence of their humors and wh whimsies. Sentries claimed they had forgotten to bring any provisions to go on duty, so they would leave their posts to go pillage a neighboring farm. The day after Washington arrived, Soldiers stole four horses from the British in Charlestown. Washington wanted to discourage plunder, so he wanted to commandeer these horses, but found that the Massachusetts Committee of Safety had already given them away. And before summer ended, one colonel and five captains would be court-martialed for cowardice or for drawing pay or, for pr pay or provisions that were not theirs. Writing to New York General Philip Schuyler, he found Schuyler commiserated, and Schuyler told Washington, of 300 New Englanders who had reported to Fort Ticonderoga too ill for duty. The moment Schuyler discharged them, they instantly acquired health. And rather than, <laughs> rather than be detained a few days to cross Lake George, they undertook a march from here of 200 miles with the greatest alacrity. Ladies who came to visit Washington and see his camp one summer day reported that as they crossed the bridge over the Charles River, they were surrounded by his soldiers who were running about naked on the bridge and diving into the water. Now, Washington, for more than a month, had been trying to get the soldiers to bathe and to clean up their camps, and he did not want to discourage this practice of bathing, but 
He wondered why they didn't have the sense other than to parade naked on a well-traveled public bridge, whilst passengers, even ladies of the first fashion in the neighborhood, are passing over it. Now, a much bigger problem than soldiers skinny dipping was their pay. Even if the army had enough money to pay them, each unit's tangled or non-existent accounts made this a nightmare. Some men had been offered signing bonuses, others were not. Each regiment counted men differently, paid them differently. Officers from one regiment would try to sign men from another or deserters so that they would all get this bonus. The Massachusetts militia were paid by the lunar month rather than the calendar month. That is, when the moon was full, a Massachusetts, the new moon, you got your pay. This meant, of course, every 28 days, the men from Massachusetts expected to be paid. And when Washington takes command, and he is going to take charge of the paying of the soldiers, they're going to be paid on the last day of the month. The Massachusetts men said, no, we get paid every 28 days. You owe us for an additional three days. Washington thought that the Massachusetts government should make up the extra 40 shillings each private was owed for each day. That's a small problem. He said that it's this invidious distinction is a fatal stab to the peace of the army. Lord North himself could not have devised a more effectual blow at the recruiting service. Short of men, the army is also short of gunpowder. When Washington had arrived in July, he was told that we have 300 barrels of gunpowder. Early in August, they gave him an update. They had forgotten to subtract the 364, about 264 barrels used at Bunker Hill. They actually had 36 barrels. That's enough for each man to fire nine rounds. And since one of the popular pastimes of these soldiers was firing their guns in the air, and probably at this moment he heard the gunfire going up into the air for some random celebration, this is, at this moment, by the way, hearing there are only 36 barrels of gunpowder on hand, Washington sent all of the officers out of the room, except for his secretary, Joseph Reed, and then he closed the door. One thing you know about Washington, if you studied him, is he had an explosive temper, and one of the real achievements of his life was mastering it. So people ordinarily would not realize this. But on this occasion, after closing the door, Washington spent the next half hour swearing vigorously about the situation he found himself in and the men he was supposed to lead. He cursed himself for taking this position and he said, instead of taking command of this army, it would have been better for him to have taken my musket upon my shoulder and entered the ranks. Or he said, if his own conscience would have allowed it to retire to the back country and live in a wigwam. But his conscience, fortunately, would not allow it and nor would the conscience of John Adams, or ultimately of those dirty, ill-trained men in the camps of Roxbury and Cambridge. These differences among them seemed too severe to overcome or to knit them together into a harmon an harmonious whole. And the truth is, they never were a harmonious whole. The states had real differences between them, and it seemed impossible that they could work together harmoniously. And the fact is, they did not but men like Adams and Washington learn how to make this work and how to accommodate these very different people into first a coherent army and then into a political fabric. And none of this was easy, nor was any of it inevitable, but they learned to work together and not to hearken to that unnatural voice telling them that the people of America could not live together as members of this same family. In his optimistic, optimistic forecasting of the next century, Franklin was wrong about Englishmen remaining united across the Atlantic, but he was right about the numbers. In 1851, England's population reached to just over 15 million. On this side of the ocean, there were 17 million citizens, not Englishmen, but Americans, no longer united with the empire, and in fact about to experience their own civil war, throwing off the empire, which they did, had been the easier part of their task. The more difficult one was to create a constitutional order out of this chaos, a structure of unity out of the disparate 
disagreeing, sometimes disagreeable people of this great country. And that they did so is actually one of their greatest achievements, as well as one of the greatest achievements of any people. And in times of division and chaos, it's tempting for us to imagine a peaceful and harmonious past in which everyone got along and everyone agreed. But in truth, peace and harmony have always been the exception, division and disorder the norm. And the work of your forebears who shed their blood in defense of our sacred rights is exemplary, not only for achieving independence, but in fostering across so many barriers geographic, political, economic, religious, social, cultural, these bonds of harmony. And so is the continuing work of this organization in strengthening those mystic cords of affection and memory which knit the people of the nation together. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison. We have microphones on both sides of the room or will soon. And uh, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Allison? The questions are all that stand between us and the bar upstairs. <laughs> Not only is he a uh, distinguished professor, he is a mind reader. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Well then, what was it that knitted them together? I mean, it seems like the deck was so stacked against them. That's a very good question. There were a lot of different things. I, I think they're finding common ground in different areas. Um, I, I think it is one of the real marvels of this. and. Not knowing that um, we all have other, I, I, I think that should be the subject of tomorrow night's lecture. What was it that, no, that's a very good question. And I think it was a recognition of these differences and of the ability to not overlook them, but to make um, different interests check one another. That's really the great thing about the American Constitution. It's not a system created for angels. If men were angels, no government would be necessary, but a system which recognizes human failings. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition, as James Madison said. And it's really that, this recognition of human nature, which isn't always good, but also isn't always bad. So that is essentially it. And also recognizing that there is greater strength in working together than in not. That if the United States, instead of becoming one nation, had become four or five, which would have been likely, or if you had broken off New England, uh, New York, if they had gone their separate ways, they would not have, the, it, it takes a great deal of, um, what would you call it, self-effacing or not giving up your interests but recognizing that you may have more in common with someone else. That's a wonderful question and I wish I had a good answer to it. It's one of the things that keeps me interested in studying history to find out how exactly they did this and how they made it work. Professor, um, I, I'm still uh, uh, marveling at all the information I learned tonight about the, vari the differences between all the colonies, and it brought to mind, we all know about the European Union in Europe, and people say that, well, there can never be a European Union, really, because all those countries have such long histories and individual natures and characters, and they say that America was different because all of those colonies were very young, very short-lived countries. And that was a factor that facilitated the creation of the United States of America. Thoughts? That, that's a good answer to the question that this lady <laughs> asked, I think. <laughs> yes, sir. Given the uh, uh, disunity that you so well described, especially in the, among the, the New Englanders, is there any indication that the British 
underestimated the, the forces of, that were against them and they thought it was going to be a piece of cake? I think that's a pretty good, pretty apt way of looking at it, that there did seem to be such differences. It would be almost impossible for them to work together. And in fact, for most of the war, it seemed like they could not work together. Um, when France enters the war, of course, it changes the dynamic of it for England. It's much less important what's happening in North America, more so what's happening either in Europe or in the West Indies. But yeah, that is, um, underestimating your enemy is always a mistake. But even looking within these New England towns, which seem to be coherent units, there are great differences. You know, in Barnstable on Cape Cod, I don't know if there's anyone here from Barnstable. Um, Barnstable touts itself as the, um, uh, I'll, okay, I'll start over. In, seven, in April of 1776, the Massachusetts Assembly asked the towns of Massachusetts, if we should have a resolution for independence, how should we vote? And every town in Massachusetts said, yes, vote for independence, except one, and that was Barnstable. I find that really heartening because most other places in the country not only claim they were for independence, but it was their idea to begin with. But here in Barnstable, they voted against it. And this is somewhat embarrassing because, of course, Barnstable is the hometown of James Otis and Mercy Otis Warren, two real firebrands. In fact, there are statues of them now in Barnstable. So how can Barnstable vote against independence? Well, there's another family in Barnstable who are hot for independence, and those are the Crockers. And the Crockers and the Otises hate each other. And in fact, one day on the militia training ground, one of the Crocker allies, who's in the militia of Barnstable under Seth Crocker, fails to salute Joseph Otis, who's also a captain in the militia, vigorously enough. And one of the Otis subalterns says, you'd better salute. And the Crocker guy says, no, I don't have to because he's not my captain. And predictably enough, a brawl breaks out between the Otises and the Crockers which culminates in one of the Crockers being chased into the tavern they keep with the Otis's following brandishing swords, trying to inflict harm on Mr. Crocker. Now, at the next town meeting, the town's leading loyalist, a man named Edward Bacon, says, what happens when we no longer have the benign influence of the crown to intercede? You're going to have the Otis's and the Crockers killing each other which seems a likely enough thing. In Washington's camp, he had guys from these towns in Massachusetts fighting with each other, and then when the Virginians arrived, there's even more trouble. So how do you meld this into a whole, and how would this work? And it really is part of the genius of Washington that he is able to bring these forces together, really recognizing the strength in each. As I said, he's really disgusted with these guys initially, but then he says, actually, they could be good soldiers something that's reinforced by Baron von Steuben, who comes. And he says, if these men had proper training, they actually would be a good army. The fact that they're different from a European army doesn't really bother Steuben as much as it might. If you explain to them why they need to do something, they will. In a European army, you give an order. But the Americans aren't like that, Steuben says. They need to know why they have to do something. And then they become better soldiers than the Europeans as they start to demonstrate really after Morristown and so on. So it's a process they go through. It's not as though in July of 1776, a beam of light shone down, but it's a process of becoming a nation, melding them out of these very different people from different places. I don't know if someone asked a question that precipitated that, but. <laughs> I don't That's know if I get question. a second hit, but um, I'm just wondering if, even though the religions were different, and I'm, I'm a pastor, so I'm tuned to this, the fact that religion was so important for so many people, even though they were different, the sort of common idea of there is a God and I'm not it, and I have responsibilities to some larger. That could be. You know? It's uh, a, a good point. This lady in front also has her hand up, too. Yes. Uh, yes, you painted an interesting picture of Franklin's uh, uh, views about uh, preferring unity or thinking there would be unity. Uh, and I think he continued that for some time, if I'm not mistaken. What, what was eventually that brought him uh, over to the uh, independence side? That's a very good question about Franklin, who, and, and by the way, this is one reason the Adamses never really trust Franklin, 
is because he really believed in the British Empire. And they didn't know, and there was some speculation, not true by the way, Franklin is on one side, his son is on the other, and that way whichever side won, the one who on the winning side would pardon the other. It doesn't happen. William Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, completely writes out of his life. Um, but I think the thing that precipitates Franklin coming over to the Patriot side was after the destruction of the tea, he is summoned, he actually had arranged a hearing of the Privy Council in London, wanting to get Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson removed and replaced with someone who could get along with the assembly. And this hearing turns into an hour-long excoriation of Franklin as the leading troublemaker, the person who has precipitated the crisis for his own selfish ends. And uh, Alexander Wedderburn, the Solicitor General, says he's not content with coming here as the agent of a provincial assembly, that is, he was there representing the Pennsylvania and Massachusetts assemblies, but he imagines himself the ambassador of an independent empire. And, and Franklin, th this room, by the way, is packed. Hearings of the Privy Council typically didn't draw a big crowd, but this one does, because everyone knew it would be a show. And the show is Alexander Wedderburn, the Solicitor General, taking Dr. Franklin down a few pegs. And Franklin looks around the room. It's packed. Jeremy Bentham is standing next to the Prime Minister. I mean, the room is packed with everyone who is anyone in British society, and they're all enjoying this spectacle this American who really thinks he's part of our society. And Franklin came into this meeting, had arranged this meeting with the hope that if we remove Hutchinson, we can allay this crisis between Massachusetts and the British Empire and thus save the empire. And he leaves the room thinking the empire isn't worth saving. And Franklin is a very important person to have on your side because of the way he works. He's referred to as the old conjurer. And then when he arrives in France in late 1776 to represent the United States, there's one thinking that the sight of Banco's ghost could not have alarmed the British ministry more than the idea that that old man is now in Paris. <laughs> so it is that moment at the Privy Council, I think, that brings Franklin over. But the, the Adamses still think he is playing some very subtle game that they don't quite understand the end will be for Franklin's benefit, which is probably not true. All of the things I quoted from John Adams shouldn't suggest that he is always right. No. Good evening. Good Could evening. you tell us about the role of the loyalists? Because we were never taught about the loyalists in school. No. Uh, did, were they very vocal, or did they mostly just pack up their bags and go back to England or the islands? Well, first, they didn't become loyalists. They remained loyal. Everyone was loyal to the crown until some people change. And it, uh, I, I hate to use such a vague term, but it really depends. Some were very vocal. Um, Edward Bake, and the fellow I mentioned in Barnstable, stays in Barnstable. In fact, he's elected to the Massachusetts Assembly. The Assembly won't seat him because he's a loyalist. They tell the voters of Barnstable, send someone else, and they say, well, wait a minute. We thought we were free to have someone represent us. We elected him. Who are you to tell us who can be our representative? <laughs> and this goes on for a number of years. They keep sending, Bar sending bacon, and uh, they, the assembly keeps sending him back. Some, some do. In fact, when the British evacuated Boston in March of 1776, about 1,000 people left with them. And some were people whose families had been there since the 1630s. Some remain in England. Uh, William Franklin becomes, in fact, the leader of the loyalist community in England. And others stay, but in many cases their property is seized from them. So Thomas Hutchinson's house is given to, actually, Mercy Otis Warren and her husband James, who is the speaker of the Massachusetts Assembly. Well, that's really a stretch. The speaker of the assembly gets the house of the former governor in this particular deal. One, the, one article of the Treaty of 1783 was that the loyalists had to be compensated. And of course, that, this means states have to tax people to pay the loyalists. And this doesn't go over well with the people who had remained here. And so it really varies from one to another, that w or one case to another. In some towns, you know, New England, um, probably had fewer loyalists than other areas, and this is not, was another area the British government saw as their strength, that New England is filled with these hotheads and religious fanatics. 
One member of parliament reported knocking on a door in Boston. The servant answered, and he said, I want to see your master. And this young woman said, I have no master but Jesus Christ. <laughs> Members of parliament also thought that was kind of absurd. So um, on the other hand, the thinking was New York, um, people want to remain loyal, New Jersey, the Carolinas. And this is why the British strategy shifts out of New England after March of 1776 to other parts of the country. New York is the British headquarters until November of 1783. And in 1778, they set up a government in Philadelphia under Joseph Galloway. And Galloway had been a member of the First Continental Congress. And he had been one of Franklin's chief political allies, but he becomes a law remains a loyalist. And then, of course, um, he doesn't administer the city of Philadelphia as well as he might. And the British leave Philadelphia, and Galloway goes into exile. So many do um, go into exile, go to England which isn't their home. Their home was here. You know, like Thomas Hutchinson, the governor of Massachusetts, goes into exile in 1774. He's driven out by the Massachusetts Assembly, and he will live the next six years in exile in London, a very unhappy time for him because he's an American. One of the high points of his life was when he received a doctorate of laws from Oxford University as a way of thanking him for what he had tried to do to avert the crisis. And he says this is one of the proudest moments of his life. It was July 4th of 1776. But he finds people in England blamed him for botching this thing. And remember, you have to start over. And your ties with your home have been cut. So um, some do come back. Um, and in some cases, another generation will come back. And Ultimately, after, since 1815, since the United States and Britain have enjoyed a better relationship since then, you know, there have been fewer hard feelings. The real losers in the war aren't necessarily the loyalists, except for Thomas Hutchinson, but the Iroquois. And the, um, but yeah, so it's a difficult situation, a difficult decision you see people making. What side will they be on? And ultimately, one reason we don't hear a lot about the loyalists is they weren't on the winning side. There's been more scholarly attention to them of late. I know your speaker a couple of years ago, Maya Jasanoff, wrote a wonderful book about the Loyalists, and there have been others because there's such a fascinating story of the Americans who don't take the road we all know. And I think we have this illusion that, of course, any of us at the time would have been on the same side, but it's doubtful we can say that with any certainty.